Nacho Libre is a 2006 film directed by Jared Hess, starring Jack Black, Hector Jimenez, Ana de la Reguera, and Silver King. In this video, I will be reviewing the film of Nacho Libre in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month and discussing certain things about it. Tenemos a Nacho. The film was initially inspired by the true story of Sergio Gutierrez Benitez, a Mexican priest who wrestled as Fray Tormenta to help support his orphanage. This true story served as the foundation for the film's script. Jared Hess, his wife Jerusha, and Mike White were the writers behind the movie, with Jared serving as director. Jared and Jerusha's previous work included 2004's Napoleon Dynamite. There are certain similarities between Napoleon Dynamite and Nacho Libre that make both stand out artistically for me, due to Jared's directing style. Jared had approached both projects in a similar manner. He and his wife had based Napoleon Dynamite in Idaho, their own home state, and filmed on location with many of the extras being local. This all made the film feel genuine. Jared took the same approach to Nacho Libre with the film's significant Mexican influences. The film was shot on location in Oaxaca, Mexico. Majority of the cast and crew were Mexicans. The selection and use of the supporting cast and extras give a raw, stylized depiction of these people, each feeling like actual people in an actual world. Jared's creative use of natural scenery was amplified by the cinematographer Javier Perez Gobert. The beautiful open outdoor settings, the warm intimate interiors, the use of the church's many symbolic elements, the production designs of the film perfectly display an interesting and enrapturing world with an unexplained 60s 70s aesthetic that gives a timelessness to the film. This inclusion just made the film feel authentic in its portrayal of a Mexican setting allowing for audience members like me to feel familiar with the environment. Certain films can make a community feel inauthentic. This doesn't allow for me to get immersed into the film. This goes for any kind of film, not just Hispanic. Jared is competent in showing a realistic world with the wrinkles and cracks and all in a truthful and respectful way. Yes! It's true. I am Nacho, the luchador. Nacho Libre was and still is a frequently played and quoted movie in my house. There aren't many childhood movies that I can look back on and they still entertain me. But this movie still makes me laugh and is just so visually and narratively beautiful. Jared was the one who reached out to Jack Black for the lead role. At first, Jack was hesitant because, opposite to his name, he's white. Fortunately, the script included the character of Nacho to be biracial, his mother from Scandinavia and his father from Mexico. This was to the benefit of the story as it added another layer of personal struggle to the character, adding to the themes of feeling like an outcast and having conflicting identities. Jack was very intrigued by the character of Nacho, the dueling dual desires of Nacho. He wants to be a man of the Lord and a man of the ring, a fighter and a servant, a classic superhero dilemma. Lucha Libre and Lucha Dores in Mexican culture and some others are in the realm of heroic mythology. They serve as these legendary heroic figures in the kayfabe of wrestling and other fields of entertainment like films and comics. I once asked my dad if there were any well-known Mexican heroes or heroic fictional figures and he just said El Santo and Blue Demon. Both luchadors who were and are highly significant in the culture, similar to Superman or Spider-Man. Luchadors promote a style similar to the pulp macho man heroes of the golden age of comics that have taken many forms throughout the decades. The style and performance of these performers and athletes greatly reflect themselves and the world around them. 
a personal touch on their character that makes them feel like a true extension of themselves. A part of themselves that can proudly be on display. Their fears, their strengths, their power, their faults. Jared and Jack were eager and respectful when adapting elements of Lucha Libre into the film and through the characters of Nacho Libre and other luchadors like Ramses. This does in a way technically mean Nacho is a superhero. Please put him in Secret Wars. I'm a person who believes that a character of a certain culture or identity should be played by an actor of that culture or identity. I will allow Jack Black to play a half Scandinavian, half Mexican priest because of the adequate explanation and how that's used in the story and the fact that it was made almost 20 years ago. Though I won't be as patient with modern films who continue to whitewash characters or with people who ignore the cultural significance and harm of whitewashing. There's definitely criticism that can be drawn from the film. Hollywood has a history of actors putting on a Hispanic voice and bravado or even cosmetics that can make us come off as criminals or overly sexualized figures or incompetent. I would say that Nacho Libre is slightly guilty of these acts. It's not as harsh as it was back then, but I do think it's important to remember. I often find it inauthentic if films only show the vibrant, wealthy side of a country. It can ignore the real parts of the country that do suffer from inadequate aid. In media, a lot of minority groups their countries and communities are used as these backdrops for the heroes to rescue or even destroy. Their depiction has no nuance, or they only have a surface level messaging that ignores a lot of the contributing factors. In Nacho Libre, Oaxaca is not used like this. Oaxaca is Nacho's home. This part of the country shouldn't be used as a stereotypical plot device to elevate the character. In Avengers, the creative team caught criticism from Indians due to their use of Kolkata in the film, a rundown environment used to reflect the character of Bruce Banner without giving any kind of context to that place beyond the surface level design. Oaxaca is not used to that extent in the film. It only shows the reality of the environment. Criticism from Nacho doesn't fall on the town or the people, but more on the lack of resources the church has that can affect the morale with the children who deserve to have a more adequate living. There is a lack of greater representation of different kinds of Hispanics. Not many women or Hispanics of darker skin tones in the main cast. I feel like one, the film has a relatively small cast who definitely could have sought out black Hispanics and two, not every Hispanic movie, especially one this size, should be made to encapsulate the entirety of the culture, but should make an effort to make the world realistic and I think it did for the most part. In the same way, I don't speak for all Hispanics, so please let your voice be heard. I think that a good way to kind of counter these criticisms, or at least lessen them, is by bringing up Jared Hess's previous movie Napoleon Dynamite, another story of an outcast. It has the same approach to depicting the setting of the film. It was comedic without being disrespectful. He was familiar with the environment of Idaho and tried to take the same respectful approach to show the environment in Nacho Libre. Too many films have models as extras. I like seeing real people, and I think both films definitely nail that. I try not to rewrite history or apologize for it, because it's a bit of a waste of time. 
the movie was made and it was released. I think you can watch something while condemning certain aspects. Not everything is going to be 100% perfect or you're going to agree with everything a part of it. That's just the state of living, I guess. But you can try to actively prevent it from happening again. If this film was made today, I would want it to be an entirely Mexican or Mexican slash whatever driven project that has the same familiarity with the culture that Jared Hess did with Napoleon Dynamite. All in all, Jack and Jared seemed to have truly respected the culture that they were emerging themselves in as much as they could. The majority of the cast and crew being Mexican hopefully influenced the film in a way that makes the final piece what it is. Where is your rope, Ignacio? It was stinky, but these are my recreation clothes. As a fat little Mexican kid, Nacho Libre was a big hero of mine, as he was to the fat little Mexican kid in the movie. I saw a lot of myself in Chantro and Nacho. Jack Black is definitely one of my favorite comedic actors and a personal role model when I was a child. Seeing someone that size comfortable with his body definitely inspired me to not be so shy and try to be more confident and comfortable with myself. Nacho Libre was one of the main pieces of Mexican and Mexican-American culture I had in my childhood. Other Hispanic films that were a significant presence included Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids trilogy. Those films were a major depiction of a Chicano family for me. That and Wizards of Ravely Place. Antonio Banderas' Zorro films, Danny Trejo's Machete, Cheech and Chong, West Side Story. Antonio Banderas, Danny Trejo, and Selma Hayek, big presence in my life as a kid. TVs where I saw even more representation. El Tigre, whose creator Jorge R. Gutierrez has gone on to develop more modern pieces of Hispanic and indigenous representation with fellow Mexican Guillermo de Toro, Maya and Miguel, the George Lopez show, Dora the Explorer and her cousin Go Diego Go, Handy Manny, another piece of media that is inspired by Lucha Libre, Mucha Lucha. There were Hispanic characters that I looked up to or found interesting. Puss in Boots from Shrek, Gomez from Adam's Family, Inigo Mantoya from Princess Bride, Pedro from Jared Hess's Napoleon Dynamite. See, he was familiar with the source material. Plenty of others that my smooth brain can't really remember. As I've gotten older, I've become more aware of Hispanics' influence and presence in comic books and comic book films. Major comic book movies being directed by Hispanics. The increasing popularity of Hispanic characters like Myers Morales gives me a lot of hope. Zorro being an influence for Batman both in-universe and in his creation. Jack Kirby's influence from indigenous South American cultures, Spider-Man having a history with Lucha Libre, there remains mistreatment of Hispanic characters. I'm still pissed about Bane in The Dark Knight Rises. They could have at least gone Javier Bardem. They cancelled a Hispanic-led Batgirl film. It's disheartening to see these companies make these artistic choices and it shouldn't be tolerated. There does seem to be a brighter future, hopefully. Namor will be played by Tenes Hurrieta in Wakanda Forever, and Zola Mary Durena will be the lead in a Blue Beetle solo film. Hopefully Warner Brothers releases that. When I was a kid, we didn't have Lin-Manuel Miranda to hold our hands. We had to take what we could get. But in all honesty, we do deserve better and we shouldn't stop fighting for it. Good representation doesn't mean we're portrayed as unstoppable, flawless figures. Good representation shows we are as human as everyone else, complex and intriguing, from the hero to the villains and all in between. The inclusion and representation of Hispanics and 
Latinx and indigenous people is hopefully growing and is done with respect and with the people of these cultures leading the way. The movie opens with a great establishing of the main character of Ignacio. He was a boy who had a dream of being a luchador, of being more than who he was, aspiring to his fullest potential. Paired with this triumphant music in the back while he assembles and lives in this fantasy, only to be dragged back into reality. He is an outcast among the monastery. He feels he doesn't belong. He isn't shown respect or praise. He can hear something greater out there calling him. Temptations that promise to deliver on his desire for glory. Nacho is more or less accelerated to give into these promises when he meets Encarnacion. This beautiful, honest, almost majestic yet human presence in Nacho's life. She's relatively shy but she speaks her mind. She knows who she is and is committed to her duty and very contempt. Nacho doesn't feel like he's adequate or special enough for Encarnacion. He doesn't see the good in him that Encarnacion sees. He needs to reach a higher standard, especially for himself. Ramses is this figure of greed and power. Everything Nacho believes will make him great and fulfill his dreams. Nacho is at first blind to the vices of Ramses. He's selfish, cruel, rude. He has no heart and no honor. Ramses is a perfect example of less is more with the villain. He is the personification of what Nacho desires, the exact opposite of the hero. He has few speaking lines, most are in Spanish and none are at Nacho, only to his fellow elites. He's a figure in Nacho's life, a bully that Nacho has to overcome. Nacho sees the luchador lifestyle as a way to achieve his dream of being on that pedestal, ignoring the harm it may bring to himself or to others. Nacho fans an ally in Steven, another man who seems to be engulfed in hardship. They're both outsiders in a way, seemingly homeless and fighting for his food. Nacho offers him the same path that he's taking to gain riches and glory. He changes from this shapeless, ordinary, bland robe to bright, vibrant tights and a mask. He assumes an identity that he feels is his true self, the one closest to his dream image of himself, the wrestler, the fighter, the winner. If you know Spanish or have Google Translate, then you know that Nacho Libre means free Nacho. A part of him is freed through this expression of himself through Lucha Libre. It's a part of himself he doesn't fully understand but tries to along his journey. A facade of confidence that is humiliated and defeated match after match by far superior and more ruthless opponents. The harsh reality of Nacho's fantasy is dragged along because of compensation, paid even though he loses. It shows how we become complacent with failure or inadequacies if we're giving a shred of what we actually deserve. The boss promises a raise so we can continue on for another six months until he makes another promise without ever delivering. Nacho fulfills his initial promise to give back to the orphans. They're the foundational reason he's wrestling. As long as he can afford to give them what they need and deserve, then he'll be complacent with his performance in the ring, but he does want more. This growing wealth does have Nacho flatter his own ego. He tries to prove to Canacion that he is more than who he is. He does so in the wrong way as he tries to flaunt his wealth in a similar manner to Ramses. And Canacion isn't one to care about appearances or physical riches. This drives Nacho to go only deeper into his quest to become the best, indulging in mystical beliefs, trying to obtain 
a higher power that Ramses seems to possess. Nacho and Stevens attempt to promote themselves into the elite status of the other luchadors ends in their absolute humiliation, a defeat to their aspiring egos, a rift between the two men who came from nothing and whose relationship is now shattered because of their attempt to have everything. Encarnacion has several great character moments. They could have played her entirely as a one dimensional shy nun, but I think Ana de la Reguera adds life to the character. She shows genuine emotion like anger and disappointment towards the orphans when they fight and towards Nacho when he was selfish by seeking out his own pleasure at the cost of his duties to the orphans. She does have genuine moments of admiration for Nacho when he shows that part of him that is truly his best self. Nacho is presented with a decision. He can continue fighting for the orphans in the battle jam or return to his life of unfulfillment as an or return to his life of unfulfillment as a cook. He tries to have an outside force decide for him, give him a sign that he's doing the right thing, tell him what he wants to hear. He is, in a way, given a sign. He's exposed for his forbidden behavior. The part of himself that he's been trying to hide is revealed. He's finally truly forced out onto his own. No monastery, no orphans, no Stephen, no Encarnacion. When he fails to win the battle jam, he feels it was because he was not meant to win. The belief in destiny and a higher power limits Nacho's ability to believe in himself and his own strength. He's forced into absolute isolation, well, kinda. Stephen can be an underdeveloped character, but there are certain aspects of the character and the performance that make him stand out. His history of being alone makes him resentful towards sharing, from the chips to the money. It's not until he sees how the orphans have struggled like he has, that he finally learns to care and see what Nacho was fighting for, becoming selfless himself. This newfound selflessness is what motivates Steven to remind Nacho what he's fighting for. He's always been a man of honor and heart, with or without the mask. He can fight if it's for the right reason, for the right people. He's given another chance and he will not waste it. The final clash between Nacho and Ramses has the perfect buildup and execution. Nacho and Encarnacion are people who are committed to their sworn duty, putting others in front of themselves. They share that compassion and care for others. Nacho's letter to her confesses his desire to indulge in his own needs and wants. Another part of him that he tries to push away. They've both sworn to a greater duty, but they still have a duty to themselves. Nacho understands that now. He hopes Encarnacion does too. We see how Ramses prepares for a fight. He's a man who truly only serves himself, motivated by his own ego and desire for victory. The final fight surrounds Nacho with temptations the gold design of the ring, the crowd of people cheering just for a fight, Nacho is in Ramsey's domain. When Nacho is unmasked, he's revealed to the world. He fights as himself, his whole self, no longer hiding behind a robe or behind a mask. He's fighting as a man with something to fight for. The moment when all seems lost and Nacho seems like he'll fail again, Encarnacion and the orphans show Nacho what he's fighting for. For his entire life, Nacho's felt like he's been alone, no real family. When he sees how Encarnacion and the orphans have come to support him, he finally feels it. He sees the people he's fighting for. This new feeling of love from the people he loves too allows him to draw from his own strength. He wins from this strength of realizing that he's had a family all along. Just a beautiful ending. Nacho gives the children a life of wonder and adventure. Steven and Nacho are no longer alone. It's not implicitly stated, but I think we can all assume that Nacho and Encarnacion have found that balance in life of duty and personal fulfillment.
Nacho Libre will always have a special place in my heart. It might be motivated by nostalgia, but it just shows that I enjoyed it as a child and as an adult. Those are truly the best pieces of children's entertainment. Enjoy when you're a child, appreciate when you're an adult. Nacho Libre has its cultural faults that can be fairly criticized. I accept that as I watch and speak about it. I do appreciate it for the representation that it is there and I will try to use it to find ways to strengthen future representation. Everyone deserves to be able to look at a screen of a world that is similar to our own and see oneself. Knowing we can exist, have the right to exist, and honor that existence with living truthfully. People too often feel like they must disown a part of themselves in order to gain respect or happiness. But there is no fulfillment if we are not living fully. Nacho Libre, I think, has that beautiful message.